I'm Emmy Lily. I'm Lilith. I'm Nancy. I'm Ruby. And this is Pose Deep and Dangerous Part 2. Alright, one more time. One, one two, three. Pose Deep and Dangerous Part 2. Out of the warm, prima dial cave of our conversations. Jack's gone. No more chit-chat under their blankets, pegged over chairs and nipped in drawers. Throughout his first five years in the ear always open, at worst ajar, I catch myself still listening out for the sounds of him in the sensible house, where nothing stirs but the washing machine, which clicks and churns. I'm loosening his arms clasped around my neck, detaching myself from his soft protracted kiss goodbye. Good boy, diminishing down the long corridors into the huge unknown assembly hall. Each word strange, even his name on Miss Cracknell's tongue. Registers, a poem by Michael Lasky. Michael Lasky was born in 1944. He's a poet and an editor. He also taught English in England and Spain for several years. Registers is a poem about a son of five going to school and how strange that makes the writer feel. On to the poetic techniques of the poem. In the first stanza, we have enjambment, which I've highlighted in blue. Out of the warm, prima dial cave of our conversations is enjambment. Enjambment is where the line runs onto the next and wouldn't make sense without the next line. So if the line made sense without the next, it wouldn't be enjambment. For example, prima dial cave by itself wouldn't make sense. In the third line of the first stanza, we have enjambment again, under the blankets, pegged over chairs. In the first stanza, fourth line, we have onomatopoeia, of which I've highlighted in pink. Onomatopoeia is when a word sounds like the noise it described. So nipped is onomatopoeia. The second stanza has another two examples of enjambment. Firstly, an ear, always open. Secondly, listening out for sounds of him. We then have personification in the last line of the second stanza. Personification is the attribution of human qualities or feelings to an in inanimate object. So the sensible house is personification. In the third stanza, firstly, it contains onomatopoeia. Clicks is onomatopoeia. In the second line of the third stanza, there's enjambment. His arms clasped, clasped round my neck and also detaching myself from his soft protracted kiss goodbye. The last stanza also has enjambment, long corridors and unknown assembly hall. The poem has the atmosphere and mood of melancholy and the form consists of four stanzas of equal length. Each stanza contains two examples of enjambment. Registers is a simple poem with straightforward form, structure and techniques. Thank you for listening to my analysis of Registers by Michael Lasky and good luck on your exams. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when its alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fall, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. This is Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. I told you a bit about Shakespeare in the last video we did, so I'm just going to start talking about the poem. Um, in the first line, he says, Let me not to the marriage of true minds. Here, Shakespeare's talking about the fusing of two souls. Another word for this would be soulmates. He then goes on to say, Admit impediments. So the whole line is, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. When he's talking about omitting impediments, he will not admit fakes or untrue love. Also a reference to the marriage ceremony, if either of you do know of any impediment why you may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony. Um, the next bit is, love is not love which alters when this alteration finds. He's saying here that love won't change if something about the person that someone loves changes. Or bends with the remover to remove. He's saying love will not make it easy for someone to take it away. In the next two lines, he says, Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. In these lines, he's talking about love being a star. It's a metaphor. 
It is the star to every wandering bark, um, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Uh, the Elizabethans didn't know what stars were made of, and height is a nautical reference. The fishermen used stars as navigation. Within his bending sickle's compass come. Bending sickle is um, pushing the imagery of death. Uh, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Love does not change with time. And if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. He's saying, if my claim is wrong, then I never wrote anything and no man ever loved anyone. Which, obviously, he has written and men have loved, so he's basically saying, yeah, I'm right. My father worked with a horse plough. His shoulders glowed like a full sail strung. Between the shafts and the furrow, the horses strained his clicking tongue. An expert, he would set the wing and fit the bright steel-pointed sock. The sod rolled over without breaking, at the headrig with a single pluck of the reins. The sweating team turned round and back onto the land. His eye narrowed and angled at the ground, mapping the furrow exactly. I stumbled in his hobnailed wick, fell sometimes on the polished sod. Sometimes he rode me on his back, dipping and rising into the plod. I wanted to grow up and plough. To close one eye, stiffen my arm. All I ever did was follow, in his broad shadow around the farm. I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping always. But today it is my father who is stumbling behind me and will not go away. I have chosen this poem because I love the way he uses family and tradition. Seamus Heaney was born on the 13th of April 1939 and died on the 30th of August 2013. He was an Irish poet, playwright, translator and lecturer, and won many awards. He was a professor at Harvard from 1981 till 1997, and the professor of poetry at Oxford from 1989 till 1994. He was described as the most important poet since Yeats. In the yellow, I have highlighted the nautical references. By comparing his job to that of a sailor, we see how hard his job is. It also helps the reader to see how strong and hard-working the father was. His shoulders globed like a full sail strung, which is a nautical reference and sibilance. Sibilance is the rep repetition of the S sound. Between the shafts and the furrow. A furrow is a narrow groove in the ground made by the horse plough. In the next stanza, he says he would set the wing, which is also a nautical reference. And the, when he uses the word expert, it shows that he's, at, he's in awe of his father's talent. The steel-pointed sock uses sibilance, and a sock is part of a blade that slices through soil. The sod is a piece of torn grass with roots. The hedrick is a point in the field where the plough and the team reach a 180 degree turn. This, in this stanza he uses enjambement with a single pluck of reins. The sweating team turned round shows a unity. And back into land is also another nautical reference. When he uses the word exactly, it shows how precise the father actually the father is. When he stumbled, it shows that maybe he does not have what it takes to follow in his father's footsteps. And a hobnailed wake is the nails in the sole of the boot. Sometimes he rode me on his back, shows fond memories that the boy had with his father. All I ever did was follow. This shows that he followed his father day after day, and it shows how he did not make an effort to reach his father's career. He, was, he followed because he was expected to. In the last stanza, when he says, but today, it shows a change in time to the present tense. The last line, behind me and will not go away shows that maybe he didn't want to follow his father's career and the guilt he feels refuses to leave. Or maybe he's taken over the job his father had, but his father still wants to be out ploughing. The metre of this poem is iambic tetrameter, which is approximately eight syllables per line. The themes in this poem are family, tradition, ageing, admiration, strength and skill and identity. I hope this helps you and good luck with your exams.
lying apart now, each in a separate bed. He with a book, keeping the light on late. She like a girl, dreaming of childhood, all men elsewhere. It is as if they wait some new event. The book he holds unread, her eyes fixed on the shadows overhead. Tossed up like flotsam from a former passion, how cool they lie. They hardly ever touch, or if they do, it is like a confession of having little feeling or too much. Chastity faces them, a destination for which their whole lives were a preparation. Strangely apart, yet strangely close together. Silence between them like a thread to hold and not wind in. And time itself a feather, touching them gently. Do they know they're old? These two who are my mother and father, whose fire from which I came has now grown cold. Jennings was born on the 18th of July, 1926, and died the, the 26th of October, 2001. Her place of birth was Boston, Lincolnshire. She then moved to Oxford, where she remained for the rest of her life. Her early achievements were the publishing of her poetry in journals such as Oxford Poetry. The poem One Flesh is more about the loss of sentimentality than anything else. It has an irregular rhyming scheme, which is unusual. There are similes, like in the first stanza, she like a girl, dreaming of childhood, and in the second stanza, tossed up like flotsam from a former passion. The book he holds unread is symbolism for that he uses it as a distraction from the loss of interest in his love. Repetition is used in the third stanza, strangely apart yet strangely close together, which is also sibilance because it involves the letter S. I hope you enjoyed this poem as much as I did. Deep and Dangerous Part 1, which is in the link in the description below. We'd like to thank you for watching this poem, Deep and Dangerous. And also, if you want to see I'm the King of the Castle summary in under 10 minutes, it's also linked in the description. Thanks for watching! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs>